Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to there we go. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Welcome to worship. Uh, this is the first time in over six years, well maybe not quite six years, that I'm late to church. Sorry about that. Uh, I guess I went a little long at the end of church. No worries. A um, couple of announcements. Doug has one. Jesus. And as you think about that, let us prepare our hearts and 
minds to worship as we listen to a prelude uh, by Emily.
We have four gospel readings, one from each of the gospels. A reading from Matthew. Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and curing every, curing every disease and sickness among the people. So his fame spread throughout all Syria, and they brought to him all the sick, those who were afflicted with various diseases and pains, demoniacs, epileptics, and paralytics, and he cured them. And great crowds followed him from Galilee to the capitals, Jerusalem, Judea, and far beyond the Jordan. A reading from Mark. The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in the prophet Isaiah, See, I am sending my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way, the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Prepare the way of the Lord. Make his paths straight. A reading from Luke. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. A reading from John. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. The Gospel of Mark. You may be seated.
family. And we will settle our differences uh, through negotiation. This was really a, a, a popular one, as so many children would go off to war and not return. And you, just when you started to get things going in your life, a war would break out and everything would be put back, turned back. Another of these pillars in, uh, was sporting events. For the first time, they started to solve their disagreements and, and use up all the aggression that was built up in young men through things like the Olympics, getting together and running races or throwing competitions. And it caused a lot of camaraderie amongst the people of particular places and time. And it worked really great for galvanizing the empire. And then the last pillar, which was a big one, was healthcare. They would train physicians and send them out to all corners of the empire. And for the first time in some places, healthcare would be able to understand the human body and why things go wrong and how to fix them. Alexander the Great was offering a better life. He was offering a chance to move into the, uh, the new age. Jesus came along. Oh, and Alexander the Great, the Great, first coined this phrase, euangelion. This is the good news of the kingdom of Alexander the Great. Does that sound familiar? So when Alexander the Great was defeated and the Romans came into power, the Romans did things very similarly. They kept many of these Hellenistic uh, ideals of a better life, but they added one more, and that was the heavy hand of empire. So if you did not follow what we say, if you did not give us a portion of everything you had, uh, we will kill you. It was called peace through victory. And what it meant was uh, if you break the peace, if you cause unrest, we will have victory over you. This is where crucifixions came into play. The Roman emperor started crucifying people who were trying to subvert the empire. There would sometimes be hundreds of people crucified at a time. People who had ideas. And so they had to uh, keep this all going the same direction, and they used force to do it. Along comes Jesus, and he has new ideas. He has a good news, a gospel of the kingdom, not of Rome, not of Greece, not of Persia, but the kingdom of God. And Jesus had four pillars. He, uh, he healed people. Uh, he performed great feats of strength and of the mind. He was known as a, an amazing person, being able to multiply food. He brought a peace, which is more of an internal peace, peace with God. And education, he went and he taught and he taught and and so the four gospel writers, many, many years after the death of Jesus, 50 plus years after, decided that they would write down uh, these stories. And each one of them was writing to a particular group of people. The first uh, gospel, the gospel of Matthew, <coughs> says that Matthew was a tax Jesus came to uh, Capernaum, a city in Galilee, and he found Matthew sitting at a tax booth. Now, tax collectors were a special kind of, of awful. They could decide how much money you need to pay 
each year to Rome. And it was up to their jurisdiction, pretty much. And they could keep as much of it as they wanted, as long as they were able to send enough money out to keep Rome happy. Can you imagine if your tax bill was based on a person that lives in your neighborhood? Someone you know and grew up with? You probably would hate that person. And you might even treat them really nice to their face. But Jesus came along and saw him working as a tax collector, a very lucrative job, but not a job with very many fringe benefits. And he said, come and follow me. And Matthew did. He offered him a chance to be a part of this evangelium, this good news of the kingdom of God. So many people think that Matthew is uh, the Jewish gospel, the gospel that uh, portrays the Jewishness of Jesus. And I would say if that is what uh, people think, they haven't read Matthew very carefully. Matthew has a genealogy. You know what a genealogy is? It's a list of this person begat, this person begat, this person begat, this person and you have an option every generation to either choose this parent or this parent. And by and large, the genealogies of antiquity, most of them were not actually uh, like factual genealogies. Instead, they were a little bit more like, we'll choose the people that their qualities represented the person we are genealogized. That's not even Genealogizing. There we go. <laughs> and so uh, they would choose this famous person or this famous person and scatter some other people in, in between. Matthew, he chooses four women to be a part of his genealogy. One of them is Ruth, the Moabite. Moabite. Tess. Not even a Jew. Jesus' lineage comes through someone other than a Jew. Wow. And you list that? And then there's Tamar, who, uh, I would tell you what Tamar did, but it is not, it's rated R. Uh, it is not for public consumption. You can go read about Tamar if you want later today. Although, just take my word. Matthew is trying to say that Jesus and the Jews are not perfect. They even include people like the outsiders, Jews who turn their back on their friends, their neighbors, who uh, sold their souls to Rome. Matthew makes a really good case. He's always turning things upside down. I would call Matthew the gospel of surprise. Everybody expects Jesus to do this, and he does this. Over and over and over again, Jesus is surprising. And, and the Jewish religious elite, oh, they just get so mad. Because he's constantly turning the power structures upside down. Then we have Mark. Now, Mark is the shortest gospel. If you've never read the gospels, I would begin with Mark. Because Mark moves it right along. He, uh, his favorite word is immediately. And Jesus immediately comes over here. And then he immediately does this. And he immediately does this. Fifteen times in Mark's gospel, Jesus immediately does something or goes somewhere. Now, a lot of people think Mark's gospel was written first. That's what I grew up believing because that's what I was told. Read a book the other day by uh, a biblical scholar, and his take on this, I think, is really interesting. He believes Mark was written first. Or Mark was written after Matthew. He had Matthew's outline, and he was writing for the Romans. Now, the Romans had a really short attention span. They had all of this public theater. They had all of these other choices. They had philosophers who gathered regularly and talked about 
life. And uh, so if you were going to be heard, you couldn't bring out this Jewish with all these references and all of these secret meanings to all of this and all of these prophecies from old being fulfilled that nobody understands. So Mark cuts all that out and he gives us a gospel quick enough to keep the attention of the Romans. Maybe it's even quick enough to keep your attention. But now Mark ended his gospel in a really unsatisfying way to the early church. So unsatisfying was it that they added some extra uh, stories and tacked them on to the end. And they made the case that it must have been lost. I think Mark ended his gospel in exactly the right place. See, if you were a Roman and you were listening to this, you were listening to the story of Jesus, the good news of the gospel of Jesus, the coming of the kingdom of God, and your heart was turned inside out, and you realized this truly is the Messiah, the first ending makes way more sense for you. Because the first ending of Mark ends with the ladies going to the tomb on Easter morning, and it's empty. And they leave terrified. That's it. That's how it ends. Well, that's unsatisfying. Yeah. But not if you're a Roman who now believes that Jesus is the Messiah. And you, your whole life is going to be turned upside down if you believe this and you follow this. See, someone else, terrified and afraid, is exactly the place where you would find yourself. Brilliant. And then we have Luke. Luke was a contemporary of Paul. We know most of what we know about Paul's life and journeys other than his letters um, by Luke's writing of the book of Acts. Luke and Acts are really the same book, an extended two-volume edition. And Luke also was not a Jew. Luke was a Gentile. He was a physician. He probably got his calling uh, when they were looking for people willing to study medicine to be part of this new Greek way of life that Alexander the Great ushered in of healthcare. And somehow he found Paul and he followed him around and his message was compelling. Paul preaching to the Gentiles and through all of the stories that he heard and from uh, gathering with eyewitnesses, he put together a very detailed account of the life of Jesus. Most details. Very orderly account. But what's interesting about Luke's gospel is that it's the outsiders that get it. In Luke's gospel, it is the Roman centurion who gets it, or it is uh, the, the Samaritan woman who gets it. I mean, the, the good Samaritan. It's always the wrong people who are the stars of the show, and the disciples can't seem to stop tripping over themselves. Luke was an outsider. It's the gospel for the outsiders. And then we have John. John is a whole different deal. Uh, John doesn't seem to care about chronology and when things happen. He wasn't trying to write anything that resembled history. He was writing with a purpose. And I believe, and this is maybe a little controversial, so if you disagree with me, we can have a conversation about it. I believe he was writing to Samaritans. One of the reasons I believe this, you ask? You're probably going to wish I hadn't told you what I've done. Over and over again in John's Gospel, when he talks about the Passover, he talks about it as the Passover of the Eudeu which is the Judeans. Now there were three different, at least three different Passover calendars. And so if someone in Judaism is talking about Passover to Jews, 
you would have to specify which of these three calendars you're talking about. And therefore, saying that the Passover of the Eudeu would say that Jesus was following the calendar of the Jewish religious elite when he celebrated Passover. Um, John has a lot of other stuff about Samaritans. And he, uh, this very telling passage when Jesus meets the Samaritan woman at the well, not in any other of the Gospels. And other, plenty of other clues to this. But who were the Samaritans? Well, they were the outcasts. When the Babylonian captivity happened and the Jews were taken into slavery, the Samaritans uh, didn't have any land. And so they didn't stay and fight. They left. They deserted. And as soon as the Babylonians carried the Jews off into slavery, they had a bunch of houses that were empty. And they came back and went, wow, I think I'll have this one. And they were despised when the Jews were released and able to come back to see other Jews eating from their vineyards and orchards and granaries. And so they were despised. I think John is reaching out in a very special and unique way to try to restore the relationship between Jews and Samaritans and between uh, the northern <coughs> ten tribes and the southern two tribes. And what he believes about salvation in Jesus is the reunification, the restoration of the nation of Israel as God's holy people. So you see, four different groups that are written to and four different ideas, uh, very different. We get ourselves into trouble when we try to say, well, in this gospel it says this, but how come in this one it says this, this, these don't agree. But they're not meant to agree. In fact, trying to harmonize them, we do more harm than good. Instead, if we want to know what God is saying to us today, we have to get a better sense of what God was saying through these good news to the people that they were saying them to. We have to ask these kind of questions. Somebody came up to me from my other church and said, um, how come you're doing a, a sermon series on questions? And I had to think about that. I mean, I like questions. I actually maybe like them too much. I don't know. But then I remember when I uh, first met my wife and we went out for a coffee, all the questions I wanted answered. I had lots of questions. And you know what the questions did? They helped me to get to know her and to trust her and to know that we are meant to be together. I think that is the purpose of questions in this sermon series. That somehow we will come to know God in new ways. And we can come to trust God. And see what God is trying to do in us and through us. And sometimes even our questions will teach us more about ourselves.